So last time we left off talking about divisions of ethics, which is one major branch of philosophy. We divided ethics into divisions or subdivisions, including meta-ethics. And in meta-ethics, the questions that are asked are the most fundamental. Questions like, is morality universal? Is it just objective or subjective? Can we derive facts from values? And which of the major theories that we're going to look at in this class should be the one that we adopt? This leads us to the, another division in ethics, normative ethics. And we have three thinkers here, Mill, Kant, and Aristotle, who put forth their own major theories on moral philosophy. So normative ethics provides us with general theories on how we ought to conduct ourselves. And whenever we apply those big theories to specific cases, where, whether they be hypothetical or actual, we're doing applied ethics. Ethics, of course, as we discussed last time, falls under one of the major branches of philosophy. There's lots of ways to cover it up. One of the ways that I like to do it is as seen here. We've got a major branch called metaphysics. And people who do metaphysics are studying reality in its most general sense questions about existence, questions about the fundamental nature of things, questions like what is there out in the world and what is it like? Those are basic metaphysical questions. Epistemology is another major branch of philosophy and epistemologists ask questions about knowledge. What is knowledge? How should we define the word knowledge, how do we analyze the concept knowledge? And I mentioned before that one of the traditional conceptual analysis, analyses of knowledge since Plato has been true justified belief. Epistemologists also are concerned with skepticism in, in its most extreme or global form. Skepticism is the view that none of our beliefs, or very few of our beliefs, count as knowledge. So if uh, your whole life is one big dream, you thought you knew who you were and your place in life and what the world was like, but it was all just one big dream or computer simulation like the Matrix, um, that would mean that um, you were right to be skept skeptical, and gen uh, general skepticism turned out to be the case. This course will focus on ethics. We're going to have questions about right and wrong. What is valuable? What is the nature of goodness? What uh, duties do we owe to one another? What are the major players in the history of moral philosophy? What are their contributions, their theories? Uh, the big question in ethics is, what kind of person should I be or what should I do in this ethical dilemma I have. And another major branch of philosophy is logic, more or less the study of correct reasoning. Uh, we're going to look at a lot of arguments for certain positions, and the way that we evaluate those arguments is by being good at logic, being able to tell when an inference is deductively valid, as it were, or inductively cogent or strong. So logic is a tool that we use to do philosophy well. And in general, as I mentioned before, philosophy, like logic, is much more an activity. It's something that you do um, as opposed to just a body of knowledge or ideas or theories. Okay, so that's where we left off last time. That's our review. So what we're going to talk about now is whether or not there's room for truth in ethics, or maybe ethics is not so much about truth or true belief, and rather it's more connected to sentiment 
or emotions. So consider these sentences and ask yourself whether or not they are true. And furthermore, whether or not they're the kinds of sentences that are appropriate to be labeled as true or false. You know, because some sentences, like questions, questions are sentences, but it doesn't make sense to label a question as true or false. You know, take the question, what time is it? You know, if somebody replied, that's false. What? I didn't state anything. I just was asking a question. Or what, um, you know, where, where is my assignment that uh, I turned in? And I just said, false. Well, I didn't state anything. I'm not making a statement. I'm not claiming anything. I'm just asking a question. So, uh, so some of these sentences, it makes sense to label them as true or false, but maybe not all of them. So the first one, sort of a description of the natural world, perhaps a scientific state, uh, sentence. Jupiter is further from the sun than the earth. And that's a sentence that expresses a statement or proposition that is arguably true. It's the case. That's the way the world is, that Jupiter's further from the sun than the earth. Same thing with the next one. It's a, a statement about, or this uh, sentence expresses a statement about the natural world. What is the case when it comes to this clear liquid that we call water? Well, chemically, it is H2O. So that statement is true. The next sentence, pizza, pizza excuse me, is delicious. So now, it's not exactly clear if that's true or false. You might say, well, it depends on who you ask. So if it is true, it's true in a much smaller sense. It's true in a sort of subjective sense or in a sense that's it's relative to people. Or maybe um, what we really are, are trying to do when we utter pizza is delicious is we are expressing um, some kind of preference that we have for, for pizza. And same thing for the, with the next one, um, musical uh, uh, sentences about uh, music. Uh, Friday, you might maybe don't remember that song anymore, but it was a, kind of a viral video called Friday by this woman, young woman, Rebecca Black, and people made fun of it. So to say that it's the worst song in the history of the world, is that uh, true? Is that false? Well, again, you might say, like, pizza's delicious, it, it either seems to be uh, true in a much weaker sense or smaller sense, maybe true for one individual or true for a, a set of people relative to a set of people or an individual, but not it's not some um, description of the world independent of people's musical tastes. Uh, so it's either true in a smaller sense, or maybe it doesn't make sense to label it as true or false false at all maybe like with pizza and delicious it might what, what we what we're doing when we utter such a sentence is we are expressing some preference some some aesthetic or musical preference and then finally we get to a a sentence slavery is wrong that's morally laden or loaded we can ask the same sort of thing is is that does that sentence express a uh, a statement or proposition that we want to say is true, and um, is it true in a bigger sense, in a stronger sense, like the, the truths about the natural world that are expressed um, in, uh, with the first two sentences, or maybe it's relative to cultures or individuals, and then maybe again, it doesn't, uh, slavery is wrong, maybe we shouldn't be saying true or false to the statement expressed by that sentence, and instead, we when we utter those words, we are merely expressing feelings or trying to convey some sort of imperative or command. So um, this is a big question in ethics. So uh, we're, we're really doing meta-ethics here. We're talking about the fundamental nature of ethics. Is there room for truth in ethics? That's our big question here. And there will be certain views, certain supporters of the idea that there is room for truth in ethics. And then there will be their opponents who argue, no, there, there isn't room for truth and ethics. Ethics or sentences that are loaded with these 
um, uh, are loaded with these words that are ethically laden with words like right, wrong, good, bad, um, morally responsible, duty, etc., that they are expressions of emotion or imperatives of some form, commands, in other words. But before we talk about those views, we need to discuss some philosophical jargon. So the word jargon is, uh, the meaning of jargon is a set of uh, words that people in specialized areas like philosophy or medicine or psychology or mathematics or um, other fields of inquiry that they, they use, kind of the, the lingo, if you will, of uh, a certain group of people, kind of a philosophy slang. So, so here are some, some bits of philosophical jargon that, um, you know, the words sound kind of funny and um, they're made up in a sense, but the distinction that hangs on those, these words are important for us to go forward. So the, the two terms are, are there on the slide, truth bearer and truth maker. Truth bearers and truth makers. So what's the difference between the two? Well, to explain the difference, let's use an example. So here we have a philosopher. This is a famous living philosopher named Tamar Gendler. And it looks like she is saying something and she's thinking something. So she has a belief that is above her head in the thought cloud and she's uttering words. So she is thinking the earth is smaller than the sun and she is saying the words the, the sentence, the earth is smaller than the sun. Uh, same thing. Now, um, we got two things here. We have a belief and we have um, a statement. Or, to, to um, more strictly speaking, we have a sentence that expresses a statement. Philosophers sometimes like to differentiate statements or propositions from sentences. Sentences are sound waves, you know, are words that are said, or ink on a page, or photons that are projected on a screen. Um, but um, in and of themselves, they're meaningless. What sentences do is they have meaning or they express a statement. So uh, a statement is what can be expressed by a sentence. And uh, I'm using proposition and statement interchangeably, though some might, uh, some might say there's a difference between them, but, but for our purposes, we won't. So, um, so loosely I'll say we've got a statement there that, um, that's being expressed by the words here and then the thought, the thought or the belief. Beliefs and statements like those two that you see are truth bearers. Why? Because they are the sorts of things that can be true or false. So Gendler here has a belief, and we want to say that belief bears, or that belief just has or is true. And she's uh, uttering words that express this, a statement that is true. So um, since beliefs and statements can be true or false, or in other words, can bear truth or falsity, we call them truth bearers. But this begs the question, well, what makes a belief or statement true? You know, you can believe something that might turn out to be true. You can uh, say something that expresses a true statement. But what makes that belief true? What makes that statement true? And for those, we turn to truth makers. What makes Gendler's belief that the earth is smaller than the sun true, what makes that belief true is the fact that this is how the world is. This is the, this is uh, reality. This is the way it is. So truth makers, you can describe them as facts or reality or the way the world is. And these truth makers, the, the facts or reality, the way the world is, this is what makes someone's belief true or what makes a statement true. 
truth bearers and truth makers. Okay, so the, that distinction is important as we go forward. So keep that in mind. You know, but, uh, before we before we continue, let me give you just one more example because um, you know the difference between these two can be can be tough to to comprehend. Comprehend. You you might uh, let me give you a second example to help us out. So um, take the belief that San Francisco is north of Los Angeles. Or if I utter those words, that expresses the statement, San Francisco, San Francisco is north of Los Angeles. So I believe it, I'm saying it, so um, that belief and that statement are truth bearers. And what makes that belief, what makes my belief true that SF is north of LA is that's how the world is, that's how the world is, right? That is how the geography is, the layout of the land. That is how we as a country and as a state have laid out the lines and the states. So um, it's the world and how it unfolded in history, in this case, that makes that belief and that statement true. Okay, so let's continue on here. So now let's talk about the different views. And so um, our question, our meta-ethical question, again is, is there room for truth in ethics? And you can see at the top of this slide here, more precisely put, the question is, do moral sentences express propositions or statements that are truth apt? That's a fancy way of asking, is there room for truth in ethics? So we have a yes answer and we have a no answer. If you say yes, if there's room for truth in ethics, then you're some sort of cognitivist. You endorse cognitivism. And uh, you might say, why does it have that name? Well, you can see cognitive is related to that ism. And cognition is related to beliefs and um, beliefs can be true or false, and hence uh, we get that yes answer. And if you reject that idea that there's room for truth and ethics, then you reject cognitivism. And so you're a non-cognitivist, and you embrace non-cognitivism. So using slavery is wrong um, as an example the cognitivist would argue that that sentence expresses a, expresses a statement or proposition that is the sort of thing that can be true or false. And our, our intuition would be that that statement is true. So why would anyone want to deny the truth about that sort of statement? Well, it's not that they think slavery is okay, Rather, it's that the statement about slavery, it's, it's, not, it's not that it's false, it's just that it's neither true nor false. So instead of expressing a statement or proposition, instead, we are expressing feelings. So you might say the word slavery is wrong, but you're, what you're really trying to convey is this expression of feeling. You're kind of saying, boo, slavery. Or maybe instead of expressing emotions, you're trying to change people's behavior. You're trying to command um, against slavery. And you're, what, you are, what you are intending is something like the command, don't enslave. So those are the non-cognitive views on that side of the chart. Now maybe you think that, uh, you know, the, the statements or proposition slavery is wrong. Yeah, it, it, it's, uh, it's true, but it's not as strong as a truth like 
the Earth is closer to the sun than Jupiter. It's not that, it's not a description of the natural world independent of human um, social customs or um, culture or beliefs, linguistic schemes, etc. So if you think, yes, it's true, but that truth depends somehow or is relative somehow to a culture or to an individual, then you'd follow the chart down from cognitivism to relativism. And you could say that the truth about uh, the truth of that statement or proposition depends on one's culture or on the beliefs of an individual. So if you think it depends on one's culture, then you're a cultural relativist. And so the statement slavery is wrong, or, or, or to be more, to be very, very precise, the sentence slavery is wrong expresses a statement, the statement slavery is wrong. Um, what that means is my culture disapproves of slavery, if you're a cultural relativist. If you are a subjectivist, say a, a cognitive subjectivist, then you say slavery is wrong, but what we really mean is I disapprove of slavery. Now, maybe you think that the truth of slavery is wrong is, is stronger than that. The scope of that truth, if you will, goes beyond uh, an individual culture or goes beyond what an individual believes or thinks. So in that case you might consider yourself to be a moral realist. So, so the, you, you say the word slavery is wrong, and that expresses a statement, the statement that slavery is wrong, and that's true. And that truth is, as it says there, mind independent. It does not depend on culture. It does not depend on individual beliefs. Just like the truth of water is H2O, or that the sun is larger than the earth, the truth of those statements does not depend on culture, cultural practices, or individual beliefs. That's just the way the natural world is. So Plato, the ancient Greek philosopher Plato, was a famous proponent of this sort of realism called moral realism. So we have got five different views here. Now three of them or, excuse me, yeah, yeah, three of them, um, the three sorts of cognitivism, all three of them say, yes, there's room for truth and ethics. The non-cognitivists argue that there's not. So what do you think? Is morality more about truth and belief and reason? If so, then you are a relativist, a subjectivist, you know, cognitive subjectivist, subjectivist, or a moral realist. Or if you think, no, I think it's more about feeling. Right and wrong is more about emotions or what David Hume, who we'll talk about, argues um, is sentiment. Then you might classify yourself as a non-cognitivist. You might be an emotivist. Ethics is more about expressions of feeling. It's like, uh, it's kind of boo yay morality. So the American philosopher Charles Stevenson or the British philosopher A.J. Eyre were emotivists. Or maybe you think that when you say something like slavery is wrong, you are issuing some kind of command to others, maybe everyone else. Maybe you want the command to be universal. Um, so R.M. Hare argued that this is more or less, this is how it is, and he was considered to be a prescriptivist. So those are the, the five views on this question. Do moral sentences express propositions that are truth that? You get yes, and then we're qualified a little bit more. How strong are those um, statements? And then you get no, and then the division there is, well, is it more about expressions of feeling or issuing of commands or imperatives? So let's talk about problems for some of these views. Well, the problem for moral realism is that it is quite strong. So the question is, or the question that gets, get, gets asked of moral realist is, well, 
if truth in ethics does not depend on a culture or belief, then on what does it depend? And if you say the natural world, it's very hard to verify that this is the case. So we have, we have methods to verify truths of the natural world, like scientific truths, like astronomical truths, like about the, the size comparison of the sun and the earth. There's a way to check that, to verify that, isn't there? We can measure the size of the earth. We can measure the size of the sun. And because the difference is so great, you can eyeball it, right? Um, actually, eyeballing it from Earth, that could lead to problems, couldn't it? Because the sun might look so small because it's so far away. But once you get past that issue of perspective and you kind of zoom out and you look at the solar system from further away, it will become very clear that the sun is larger. So we have a, we could verify that fact. But how would you go about verifying some moral truth like slavery is wrong? There's a difficulty there. And then how do we come to know that uh, these truths? Um, the verification process helps us gain knowledge about the world. So the um, there, let me put it this way. There are serious unanswered questions about the nature of so-called moral facts and serious unanswered questions about how we would come to know them. So the issue of the nature of these so-called moral facts, that's a metaphysical problem. And the issue with how we would come to know them that is an epistemological problem with moral realism. So we got two problems, again, with moral realism. One, there are too many unanswered questions about the nature of moral facts. And two, it's not clear how we would come to know them. We would need some sort of moral intuition, which we might have, but that is a tall order to verify or support or argue for or prove that we have that. Okay, now, on to problems for the next views, starting with cultural relativism. Well, one problem with cultural relativism is that it doesn't seem to allow for moral progress. It doesn't seem to allow for moral progress. And what I mean by that, what I mean by moral progress, let me give you an example. If you think that as time has passed, as history has progressed, that human beings, uh, human beings' sense of morality has changed for the better, then you believe in moral progress. For instance, think about all the mor uh, morally bankrupt or morally um, just flat out wrong practices that exists in the past. So we talked about slavery. Um, think about these social injustices that existed still to this day, unfortunately, but much more in the past when it comes to minorities, when it comes to communities of color, when it comes to women, when it comes to members of the LGBTQ community. You know, less than 100 years ago, um, women couldn't vote, and more and more recently, um, a, a woman got more votes than anyone else in the uh, in the popular vote. Right, Hillary Clinton got the um, got more votes than anyone else in the in the general election in 2016. And if it were um, 1917, or it were more than 100 years ago. Not only could a woman not run for office, not couldn't run for the presidency, but wouldn't even be allowed to vote in that election, right? So, uh, arguably, we've made moral progress. Well, if you believe that we've made moral progress, 
then you shouldn't be a cultural relativist because that is precisely something that's not allowed. Why not? Well, because morality, by definition, is whatever your particular culture, the majority culture that is, not like a counterculture, whatever the mainstream culture counts as moral or immoral. So if we took a time machine hundreds of years ago in our country, the mainstream culture at the time accepted some forms of slavery. Therefore, slavery is morally acceptable. And anyone who... Um, the abolitionists who fought against slavery, they were in the wrong. They were doing something immoral. Because by definition, slavery was morally acceptable and they rejected that view and so, by definition, they, their actions were in the wrong direction. So, cultural relativism in this uh, perhaps extreme or even radical form is very problematic because it doesn't allow for moral progress. So, that's objection number one. Objection number two, cultural relativism doesn't allow one to correctly criticize another culture. In other words, there's no universal moral codes. So it doesn't allow for universal moral codes. Now maybe some moral codes, um, maybe they, they in fact vary from culture to culture and maybe that makes sense. Perhaps there is a short list, as it were, of rules that really are objective and or universal. For instance, the rule don't lie or the rule don't kill or harm innocent people or the rule children should be taken care of and should not be neglected. So there might be some rules, like, so we got this, you might be saying, what's going on with this image of this cute puppy? What does that have to do with um, cultural relativism? Well, in some cultures, cute puppies like this are pets. And in another culture, it might be that uh, a puppy would be food. And uh, so the rules here versus somewhere else might be different. And, um, you know, maybe there's, maybe there's just no way to resolve that issue. It's just, well, if you grew up in that culture, you would feel differently. And we don't want to impose our morality on anyone else. But there's something good about cultural relativism is that it promotes tolerance. So a lot of us would like that. But, um, but the big problem is it doesn't allow for any universal moral codes. And if you, so if you believe that, uh, say, don't lie, don't kill innocents or harm innocents, and don't neglect children. If you think that those are rules that should be adopted by any culture, cross-culturally, then you shouldn't be a cultural relativist because you are denying one of the core tenets of cultural relativism is that there is no such thing. That's one of the, the, the basic ideas of relativism is that there are no universal truths. So um, we look at people who lie in, uh, historically or who harmed innocents. You know, you can think of slavery or you can think of concentration camps, for example, or you looked at child neglect and um, if that was practiced in some other culture, um, you, we, you would criticize, a lot of us would criticize that. And if you're a relativist, you can, you can criticize it, but you can't be, criticize it and be correct. You can kind of, all you can kind of do to shout is, my culture disapproves of that. And that won't get you anywhere because the response will be, well, my culture is okay with it. Uh, an example from the reading was what to do with the dead. So you've got these two groups. You've got the ancient Greeks and you have the Colossians, I believe. And what did they do with the dead? Well, the Greeks would bury the dead and the Colossians would eat their dead. And so um, if you think 
that uh, you could say, well, that's just a matter of culture, then there's some relativism there. But if you think that there's a rule about respect for the dead that should be followed regardless of culture, then you're leaning away from relativism. Okay, so let's go on to the next meta-ethical view, which is subjectivism, or what I sometimes call cognitive subjectivism. So um, <clears throat> what are some of the objections here? Well, one of the major objections is that subjectivism does not allow for meaningful moral disagreement. Subjectivism does not allow for meaningful moral disagreement. What do I mean? Well, here's an example. Suppose that one person advances their belief that toes are for dancing, and another person disagrees and say, no, toes aren't for dancing, they are for sucking. It looks like we have a major disagreement here, right? And if we go with extreme subjectivism, there's no truth of the matter, there's no fact of the matter. Person A has their view, person B has her view, and that's the end of the debate. Now on the face of this, it looks like there is a, uh, a budding of heads. Toes are for dancing, toes are for sucking. And um, so let's say we add only there to make it uh, clear that there is an inconsistency. Toes are, are only or just. Toes are just for dancing or only for dancing. Toes are only for sucking. Could both of those be true? No. If they're just for dancing, then they can't be for sucking. If they're just for sucking, I make myself laugh when I keep repeating this. Uh, and this image, I'm sorry, it's kind of, um, it's a little bit uh, out there. So my apologies to those that are, um, took offense to that. But they both can't be true. Now, remember that if we're subject to this, we have to rethink our interpretation of the initial sentence, let's say. And the sentence uh, there, or we could make them statements, toes are for dancing, toes are for sucking. What does that really mean? Well, we make we have to, we have to go subjective. So, so toes are for dancing becomes I, person A, approve of toes for dancing and only toes for dancing. And person B's statement becomes, I disapprove of, um, or, or I, I approve of toes for sucking and only sucking. And those statements can both be true, believe it or not. Because it is, they're both true. Person A, it is true that they approve of it for dancing and only dancing. And person B, it is true that they are for sucking and only sucking. So the logical inconsistency goes away and um, the disagreement also goes away. And if you can't have disagreement, you can't have meaningful disagreement. But this is an objection to many because we have debates about what is about right and wrong all the time. And they do seem to be fruitful and meaningful. Why do we debate all these things if it's just subjective at the end of the day? So subjectivism almost makes morality out to be like food preferences. And maybe it is kind of silly to have a debate with someone about whether or not, um, you know, whether or not In-N-Out Burger is the, the best of the fast food burgers. It just comes down to a matter of taste. We shouldn't even really debate it. It's kind of silly. But morality seems to be different. There is reason for debate and it can be fruitful and we can, it can contribute to moral progress, which a lot of people believe in. So that's the first objection to cognitive subjectivism. The other objection is that if we go with this view, it would entail that every individual is morally infallible, which is a fancy way of saying can never be wrong. Put it this way. If you believe that sometimes people get morality wrong, in other words, if people sometimes mess up when it comes to ethics, then you shouldn't be a cognitive subjectivist because that's not allowed or that never happens. 
when we go from, say, slavery is wrong to I disapprove of slavery, we go from something that is up for debate, you know, maybe that's not very controversial, but it still could be, uh, there's a bit debate about it, to something that's just going to automatically be true. You know, you know, take someone like an Adolf Hitler who, you know, believed that the annihilation of these innocent people was morally acceptable, right? So we want to say that Hitler's not morally infallible and he was wrong in those actions, morally wrong. But when you do the translation, right? Uh, annihilating innocence is wrong, but now translate it for subjectivists. What does that become? Go back to the chart, right? Let's go back to the chart. It goes from annihilating innocence is wrong and then look down under cognitive subjectivism. You got to make it that I statement. And when you make it that I statement, it goes from something that could be false to something that's automatically true, right? Annihilating innocence is morally acceptable. So we would say that statement is false. But then when you make it I, all of a sudden it's true. Why is it true? Because Hitler would say, I approve of annihilating these innocents. And was that true? Did Hitler believe that? Yes. So um, people, as long, whatever people, what other people say about morality, as long as they're being honest, you know, saying something that they actually believe, they're automatically going to be correct. So let me, let me recap. We've talked about moral realism. We talked about cultural relativism and subjectivism. Three views. And we talked about two objections to each. Objection number one. So you take a note. Objection number one to moral realism. There are too many unanswered questions about the nature of so-called moral facts. Objection number two. There are too many unanswered questions about how we would come to know about the so-called moral truths or moral facts. Now, cultural relativism, two objections. Number one, it doesn't allow for moral progress. Aren't we making moral progress? If you think yes, then you shouldn't be a relativist because that can't happen. Objection number two to cultural relativism. It, uh, it, two ways to put it. Either it doesn't allow us to correctly criticize other cultures, or the way I like to put it, it doesn't allow for any universal moral rules or codes. So do you believe in some universal moral rules or codes? If you say no, well, think about don't lie, don't kill or harm innocents, don't neglect children. It seems like those are moral rules wherever you go, and they should be moral rules. So that's the second objection to relativism. Now to sub subjectivism. Problem number one, it doesn't allow for meaningful moral disagreements. Why? Well, because when you go, when you take the original statements, like slavery is wrong, and you subjectify it, if you will, it becomes an I statement. And those two I statements no longer are butting heads. They're logically, logically consistent. They could both be true. Problem number two with subjectivism is it entails that everyone is morally infallible, that, pe that people never get morality incorrect. But that's ludicrous. People get morality wrong all the time and just look at the worst figures in history as examples. Um, but if we go with subjectivism, Hitler didn't get morality wrong. So at least in these extreme forms, these views are very problematic. Okay, we'll stop there for now. And we'll pick up next time with emotivism and prescriptivism. Thanks for listening.